Welcome to Sundays with Brother Barry Scott. Hey, hard to uh, believe, but uh, according to my uh, calculations, uh, this uh, sermon will actually, uh, you'll be hearing it on Facebook or YouTube. You can catch it either place, and it's usually posted very early on uh, Sunday. Uh, this will be coming along about the first uh, Sunday in May. Now, I'm preaching on one of the best-known passages uh, in the New Testament, uh, and probably the best known passage just about out of the Gospel of Matthew. It's a passage that has a name. We call it the Great Commission. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, as we think about, and this is the sermon title, Making Disciples of All Nations. Matthew 28, verse 16 and following. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Here's an interesting little bit of information. Did you know that across the United States, there are at least a dozen or more bridges that have never been connected to a road. Uh, they sometimes are referred to as bridges to nowhere. You just got a bridge, but it serves no purpose. Uh, nothing goes across it because there's nothing connecting. Uh, some of these were port uh, projects by politicians, uh, by the way. Now, let me tell you something. A church can become like a, one of those bridges with no highways. A church can look good and prosperous, but if it's not doing what it's supposed to do, it can be as worthless as a bridge with no roads. A bridge that carries no traffic is a bridge in name only, and a church that does not fulfill the Great Commission is a church in name only. Uh, listen, uh, if you understand the rest of the Gospel of Matthew, but you fail to understand this passage, you've missed the whole point. This is really the climax and the focal point, not only of this gospel, but really the entire New Testament, you could say the whole Bible. This central message pertains to the central mission of the church. Tragically, many Christians do not understand or they are unwilling to fulfill it. Uh, we have so much consumer mentality in the church. What, what do I get out of this? Will this church meet my needs? Thus they are involved only to the extent that it serves their own desires. We need to realize the Lord Jesus has given a supreme mission to his church, all churches. And Christians, every believer, is called to be an instrument in fulfilling that mission. What is the primary purpose of the church? Why does any church exist? Now, I think a survey would certainly give us a, a number of diverse answers. Some people would say, well, the main purpose of the church is fellowship the opportunity to associate and interact with, with fellow Christians. Others would say uh, it's sound biblical preaching and teaching, uh, getting a strong grounding in biblical truth, helping believers to know, obey, and apply God's revealed truth. Some will say, well, it's the praise of God in worship. 
Uh, praise is a central purpose and will continue to be so in heaven. Now, I want to tell you, uh, all of those answers are biblical. All are characteristic of a church. But neither separately or together are they adequate to fulfill this great commission. The supreme purpose and mission of the church is to glorify God. Wouldn't you agree? But how is that best done? What brings God the greatest glory? And it's a, word, word, uh, a one word answer, salvation. Nothing so much glorifies God as his gracious redemption of sinners through the saving work of Christ. God's heart has always yearned to bring sinful, rebellious people back to his grace, giving them eternal life through Jesus Christ. He so greatly loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. The great mission of the church is to call people to Jesus Christ. Fellowship, teaching, and praise are not the mission of the church but are rather the preparation of the church to fulfill its mission of winning the lost. Uh, you see, if it's all these other things, let me tell you, fellowship, uh, growth, worship, are all going to be better accomplished in heaven. The reason the church remains is to seek and to save the lost. All the rest of these things can be accomplished in heaven, but you can only win the lost. You can only make disciples right here and now. And yet we find churches willing to do any and everything but the main Thing. No real urgency or concern. It saddens me, uh, and it even saddens me about myself. I'm not sure that we really see people as lost. Pluralism, tolerance of all viewpoints, all roads lead to God. Uh, that so predominates people's thinking. So listen, if, if that's true, then the cross was unnecessary. Jesus and his disciples were wrong and there's no need for this great commission. Couples who are prospering materially and socially are admired, congratulated, but if they do not know Jesus Christ, they're not doing well. We act as if people's lostness really doesn't matter. Uh, okay, either it is a tremendous issue of heaven or hell, or we might as well forget it. If our unsaved friends were in danger otherwise, we would go to their assistance without apology. Yet Jesus came to seek and to save the lost and died for their salvation. There's something hypocritical about claiming to believe that and then acting as though it's not important. We may not like it, we may be reluctant and admit our embarrassment, but let's be honest enough to say there's little doubt about what Jesus said and meant. The Great Commission was his all-important departing instruction. In this final message of the Lord to his disciples on earth, there are five elements necessary to carry out this mission. Here they are. Availability, Worship, submission, obedience, power. Uh, first, the attitude of availability. The 11 disciples were where the Lord told them to be. Verse 16, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them. If you are not in the place where God is blessing, you will not get blessed. The most gifted and talented Christian is useless to God if that Christian is not available. Faithful discipleship always begins with simply being available to God. As uh, one of my favorite sayings, it, it, it's not your ability, it's your availability that's all important. You'll miss the blessing if you're not available to receive because they were there where Jesus told them to be. They met Jesus. They were commissioned and promised power. The second element of fulfilling the church's mission is the attitude 
of genuine worship. Verse 17, it says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Now, notice this. They worshiped Jesus as God. Not as a great leader, teacher, etc. Only on one other occasion in Matthew's gospel does it say that the disciples worship Jesus. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 33, after they witnessed him walking on the water, they worshiped him saying, you are certainly God's son. Now their certainty of his divinity has been proven by the resurrection. Jesus is the object of true worship for the church. But I want you to also see this. The amazing honesty of the gospel accounts. It tells us that some doubted. Now this one is not referring here, I believe, to the 11 disciples. Uh, this is referring to that greater gathering. We know that there were at least 500 of the brothers that witnessed the resurrection at one time. That's not counting any women and children uh, that were there. Uh, uh, of that group, uh, some may not have really seen, some, if you got that, that many people, some were not that close. The fact that the Bible is willing to include this statement points to the truth of God's word. But I tell you, uh, at this point, none doubted after Jesus spoke. An effective church is a worshiping church and its worship is Christ-centered. The essence of true worship is a single-minded, unhindered, and unqualified concentration on Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. The third element fulfilling the church's mission is the willingness of submission to the authority of Jesus Christ. Verse 18, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Before his commission, Jesus states his authority. He has that much authority, the disciples can only respond in humble submission. Uh, now listen, uh, I like authority. I like being in charge. <laughs> Most preachers do. But I've never had complete authority any place or anywhere. I, I never had it in a church. I'm right here in my home. Let me tell you something. I've never had complete authority here in my own home. Uh, because what does authority mean? It, it means the freedom to speak and act as one pleases. Now that's not the believer's option. Our obligation is to submit to the Christ who has the authority. An attitude that leads the disciple to say, whatever the Lord commands, I will seek to do. Christ is above all human persons. He's above all princes popes and ponitates, above all bishops and superintendents, above all preachers and teachers, editors and elders. He is above all persons, and that must mean he's above me. I can put him above prophets, priests, kings, governments, wealth, etc. But can I really put him above me? Now that's the real issue for me. I suspect it is for you too. Brings us to the fourth element for fulfillment of the church's mission. Obedience, verses uh, 19 through the first part of verse 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Uh, okay, the main thought of this passage is to make disciples our disciple making. And a disciple here refers to anyone, to those who put their trust in Christ and follow him continually. Uh, scripture never separates Savior from Lord. Every convert is to be a disciple. Uh, there was a rich young ruler in the Gospels who came and, and he wanted to be a disciple, a follower of Christ, 
But he did not because he was not willing to submit. He failed at the point of obedience. To obey is the great omission in the great commission of the church and it's caused a great commotion. The Great Commission is a command to bring people throughout the world to a saving knowledge of Christ and the term the Lord used in this commissioning is make disciples. The true convert is a disciple, a person who has accepted and submitted himself to Christ. The truly converted person is filled with the Holy Spirit, given a new nature that yearns to obey and worship the Lord who saved him. Jesus' supreme command is for those who are disciples to become his instruments for making disciples of all nations. Those who become his disciples are themselves to become disciple makers. The winning and making of disciples has always been the main mission of the church. There are three specific requirements Jesus says about this. Go, baptize, Teach. First of all, the church is not to wait, but to go. There's too much waiting in the church and not enough going. Don't think that you can just open the doors to the church and the people are going to come. When a young minister asked the Duke of Wellington whether he did not consider it useless to attempt to evangelize India, the Duke of Wellington sternly replied, what are your marching orders, sir? What are your marching orders? Go. Next, baptism. Uh, baptism is an act of identification that one belongs to Christ. The God-ordained uh, accompaniment to our salvation uh, to the work of grace. The Trinitarian name implies the fullness of all God is and represents. Teach them to obey. Uh, the church's mission is not simply to convert, but to teach. A disciple, by definition, is a learner and a follower. J uh, John 14, verse 23 and following, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. The, these words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. A disciple is one who believes everything that Christ says and does everything Christ commands. <laughs> At the entrance to a, a small inn in a town in Vermont is a regulation size post office box. Instead of having posted the usual hours of collection, this is what's posted on that uh, post office box. Neither rain nor snow nor gloom of night shall stay us from delivering this mail to the post office across the street at least once a day, weather permitting and providing there's enough mail in the box to make the trip worthwhile. <laughs> I, a lot of Christians are like that about their obedience. As long as it's convenient, they'll be obedient. Uh, finally, not only is there availability, worship, submission, and obedience to fulfill the church's mission, there is essential power provided. You see, all the rest of this would be futile and impossible without his power. It, it would be the equivalent of being handed a shovel and then being instructed to fill up the Grand Canyon. It just couldn't be done. Verse 20 ends with this. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The King James says, lo, or verily. Listen, that always in Scripture introduces matters of great importance. Uh, Jesus says, I am, I, I, myself am, the divine, resurrected, living, eternal Lord, and with you always. He will always be with those who belong to Him. I want to close 
with a piece of writing from Max Licato. He's, he's so well known and uh, he's written a lot of great books. But it is the parable of the candles in the storage closet. Uh, listen to this. He's talking to candles as we start. Don't take me out of here. What? I said, don't take me out of this room. What, what do you mean I have to take you out? You're a candle. Your job is to give light. It's dark out there. People are stubbing their toes and walking into walls. You have to come up and light up this place. But you can't take me out. I'm not ready, the candle explained. I need more preparation. I couldn't believe my ears. More preparation? Yeah, I decided I need to research this job of light giving so I won't go out and make a bunch of mistakes. You'd be surprised how distorted the glow of an untrained candle can be. So I'm doing some studying. I just finished a book on wind resistance. I'm in the middle of a great series of tapes on wick buildup and conservation, and I'm reading the new bestseller on flame display. Have you ever heard of it? No, I answered. You might like it. It's called Waxing Eloquently. All right, then, I said. You're not the only candle on the shelf. I'll blow you out and take the others. But just as I got my cheeks full of air, I heard other voices. We aren't going either. It was a conspiracy. I turned around and looked at the three other candles. I was getting a little angry. Your candles and your job is to light dark places. Well, that may be what you think, said the candle on the far left. You may think that we have to go, but I'm busy. Busy? Yes, I'm meditating. What, a candle that meditates? Yes, I'm meditating on the importance of light. It's really enlightening. And everyone needs to study and research for goodness sake. Hmm. And you other two, I ask, are you going to stay in here as well? A short, fat, purple candle spoke up. I'm waiting to get my life together. I'm not stable enough. I lose my temper easily. I guess you could say I'm a hothead. The last candle had a distinctive female voice. I'd like to help, she explained, but lighting the darkness is not my gift. All this was sounding too familiar. Not your gift? What do you mean? Well, I'm a singer. I sing to the other candles to encourage them to burn more brightly. Without asking for permission, she began a rendition of this little light of mine. The other three joined in, filling the storage room with singing. Hey, I shouted above the music. I don't mind if you sing while you work. In fact, we could use a little music out there. They didn't hear me. They were singing too loudly. I yelled louder. Come on, you guys. There's plenty of time for this later. We got a crisis on our hands. They wouldn't stop. I took a step back and considered the assertive of it all. Four perfectly healthy candles singing to each other about light, but refusing to come out of the closet. That was all I could take. One by one, I blew them out. They kept singing to the end. The last one to flicker was the female. I snuffed her right in the puff part of won't let Satan puff me out. I stuck my hands in my pocket and walked back into the darkness. I bumped into my, into my wife. Where are the candles, she asked. They, they don't, they won't work. Where did you buy those candles anyway, she said. Oh, they're church candles. Remember the church that closed down across the town? I bought them there. I understood. The great commission of the church making disciples of all nations. Let's make sure that we help fulfill that great commission. May God add his blessings to his word. Amen.